Dr. Carvajal is here. And again, another one of uh, the pioneers in melanoma therapeutics uh, who has transitioned from uh, just taking care of one type of melanoma of scutaneous to looking into ocular melanoma and taking what we have seen in early development and breeding a phase one clinical program at Columbia. Uh, Dr. Carvajal is one of the leaders in ocular melanoma and he'll discuss with us new events and what to expect in the upcoming years. Dr. Hamid, thank you. Thank the Angeles Clinic. Thank AIM at Melanoma for putting this together. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me share my screen. So what I wanted to do to, to close up this fantastic meeting is spend a little bit of time talking about some of the progress that's been made in ocular melanoma. Here are my disclosures. Okay, and just in the way of background, this, this is a slide uh, that to be honest, I was showing up until uh, very, very recently. Um, most of this is still true. Uvular melanoma is, remains a rare subset of, of this disease. It's about 5% of all um, melanomas that are diagnosed. Um, unlike cutaneous melanoma, which has a rise in incidence, um, the incidence or the occurrence of this disease has remained fairly stable worldwide. Um, and importantly, this disease is molecularly and clinically distinct um, from cutaneous melanoma. Um, despite uh, treatment of the primary melanoma with radiation or nucleation, um, there's still a risk that this can come back distantly. And that's, that's um, fairly significant. It tends to recur in the liver. And, uh, and th this is the piece that, um, that, that has thankfully really changed. So I used to say there's no effective therapy for advanced uveal melanoma. And now that, that's no longer the case. Um, I, you know, this is a slide I put together last night, actually. Uh, and I just was just kind of curious to see, um, you know, what the pace of uveal melanoma research has been. And so I just went on this website called PubMed, where you can search all the literature um, about any disease. And I typed in uveal melanoma. And here you see the number of publications uh, for this disease, you know, in the 60s, there are just a handful of publications a year. Um, and now, now we're up to, you know, over 400 publications a year. So still not a lot, but a marked improvement. And I show this because um, all the science for the sake of science is good. Um, the, the goal is really to improve clinical outcomes. And, um, and you know, what, what we finally done as a field um, is improve the clinical outcomes for patients with with uh, uveal melanoma. And so this is the press release that came out in November. Um, some of you may have seen this. Uh, Aminocor is a drug company that's been developing this drug that many of us have been working with called Tabentafus. Uh, and Tabentafus has been demonstrated to have improved superior overall survival compared to investigator's choice in a phase three clinical trial in patients with previously untreated metastatic uveal melanoma. Uh, and, and this is a big deal. Um, before this trial, we have never um, proven that any um, therapy meaningfully improves the outcomes for our patients, and, and that's, that's changed. And so here, the primary endpoint of overall survival favored to Bentafust uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.51. Uh, what this means is that uh, the risk of dying from the disease is reduced by almost 50% if patients get this, um, get this drug. Uh, importantly, this is, this is the first positive phase three clinical trial uh, for any T-cell receptor therapeutic or any bispecific. And again, uh, for our patients, it's the first positive randomized phase three trial for patients with ocular melanoma. Um, and it's, uh, you know, uh, again, a, a game changer for our patients. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this drug. Um, Tabentafus is basically what we call a bispecific. It's a molecule that has kind of two functional ends. Um, and so um, Tabentafus is basically depicted in this cartoon here by this dark blue piece. Um, and one end of it um, recognizes um, something called TP100, which is just this protein that's heavily expressed on uveal melanoma when it's expressed uh, by a certain HLA protein. Um, and HLA is a molecule that um, that 
shows pieces of proteins to the immune systems in different ways. Importantly, Tibentum Plus only recognizes this TP100 protein if it's presented by um, an HLA AO201 molecule. Um, and so again, very, very important. This drug only works in patients who have this certain tissue type, this HLA AO201 tissue type, which is found in about 40% of uh, Caucasian uh, patients. Okay, so one half binds uh, very tightly to the CP100 protein, and the other half binds to these uh, CD3 proteins that, that are expressed on uh, T cells. And basically what it does is just brings the tumor cells and the immune cells into proximity. And that by itself is enough to cause tumor cell death, okay? Now, um, the press release um, talked about a randomized phase three trial uh, and more data is gonna be presented in an upcoming scientific meeting in, in April. What I wanna do is talk about some data that we've already presented that's already publicly available. And one of the um, prior big trials that we did um, was this IMCGP100-102 trial. And this is what we call a phase two clinical trial where we treated 127 patients um, with metastatic uveal melanoma who were HLA AO201 positive um, patients had to have had a prior um, therapy in a metastatic setting. And then patients received this treatment. The treatment itself is a little bit complicated. It's um, given intravenously weekly, so it's a weekly IV treatment, uh, with the first three treatments given um, in the hospital for monitoring uh, because of some of the recurrent side effects that we see that I'll go into in just a, a few minutes. Now remember, this drug meaningfully improved um, how, how long people live with this disease. The primary endpoint for this trial though, wasn't what we call overall survival, it was actually what we call a response rate. How good is this drug in causing tumor shrinkage? Um, and interestingly, the likelihood of tumor shrinkage here was uh, fairly modest. Uh, it was really about 5%. And so this is that waterfall plot. Each uh, bar represents a patient. If the bar goes down, it means the tumor shrinks. Um, and although about 44% of patients treated had some degree of tumor shrinkage, it's only that minority of patients here in the far right that had really what we call major, major um, radiographic shrinkage. Um, and, and this sort of decoupling of um, survival uh, from tumor shrinkage is, is reminiscent of something that we saw uh, with a drug called ipilimumab or Uruvoy, which you've heard about earlier. Um, in, in this meeting, it's the anti-CTLA-4 antibody. Uh, and this is um, an older trial where uh, patients with cutaneous melanoma were randomized to different doses of this ipilimumab drug. And interesting, the response rate um, across the three arms were also fairly modest. You know, you know at best 11% is a very high dose of the drug, um, but we did, did see significant improvements in survival and um, cures of patients with this disease. And so it's interesting that to think that tibentafusp in uh, uveal melanoma may have a similar um, kind of characteristics that is it can help improve survival despite the fact uh, that it really doesn't shrink tumor uh, as well as we might ideally like it to. In terms of the side effects, again, uh, the treatment complicated, it is IV weekly, it does require inpatient hospitalization for the first three doses. And that's because of these recurrent side effects that we see. Uh, most commonly, um, there are two classes of side effects. <clears throat> One class of side effects listed in kind of tan here are side effects caused by um, um, the, the drug itself recognizing not just the tumor cells, but also the melanocytes, the normal pigment cells in the body. Uh, which is present obviously in the skin and that can cause rash and itching and dry skin and things like that. Um, and so rash is very, very common. What I would highlight here is that if you look at the figure on the right here, a rash is most common during the first few doses um, and then becomes less problematic later on. Um, the dark blue here represents patients with a very, very bad rash. Um, and again, it's more common to have a bad rash with the first few doses and then this becomes less of a problem later on. The other class of um, side effects that we see are um, what we call um, um, uh, like cytokine release syndrome. So it's activation of the immune system, which can lead to uh, drops in the blood pressure or fevers or chills. 
Um, and again, just like with a rash, these um, cytokine release syndrome side effects are most common during the first few doses and then tapers off later on. <clears throat> so again, Dementasus, you know, really a game changer for patients with this disease. Um, meaningfully improves overall survival. Um, but we are still seeing patients in whom they get some degree of benefit for a while and then it stops working. And so we have been doing work getting biopsies of patients uh, before we start treatment, biopsies on treatment, and then at the time of um, disease progression uh, to see if we can figure out what might be changing, what might be leading to uh, that, uh, the drug to stop working. And so this is one patient that we reported on several years ago where we had biopsies of the tumor at baseline with two panels A, C, E, and then at resistance. And some of the questions that we asked were, um, are there more or less immune cells at the time of cancer progression um, that may kind of explain this? Because you might think that um, when the cancer grows, it might be because the immune cells are no longer able to get to the tumor. Um, now here we see actually there are more purple cells here and actually at progress or green cells here and at progression, there are actually more immune cells uh, than at baseline. And so that wasn't the explanation. Um, we asked, maybe there's less GP100 protein at the time of progression. Maybe the tumor cells are somehow no longer expressing that antigen, that protein that the immune system and the Tibentafus needs to recognize to work. And again, that's here in, in orange here. And you can see there's actually more um, antigen at the time of progression. Um, than at baseline, so that's not the explanation. One change that we did find though was that there was an increased number of what we call these myeloid cells, which are another type of immune cells at the time of progression. Um, and some of these myeloid cells are actually um, inhibitory in terms of uh, an immune effect. And so if there are more of these bad myeloid cells that may inhibit the immune response to the tumor. And again, this is hypothesis generating, but I think it's really important work um, um, helping to guide um, how we further develop this drug, how we um, work to get this drug to work better for more patients for a longer period of time. Um, and so this is, this is a slide that I've, I've shown um, previously. And so some of you may have seen it, but I, I do think it's pretty striking that this is a 50 year old, 52 year old female uh, with a uh, uveal melanoma, underwent a nucleation or surgical resection of the eye and then ultimately developed metastatic disease 26 months later. And all the spots here that are white are all these sites of um, metastatic disease. And so this patient got uh, dipalimumab and nivolumab and achieved this really remarkable response that was really, really durable for um, several years actually. And I think what's, what's most striking about this patient is um, <clears throat> that before she got dipalimumab and nivolumab, um, she had previously gotten ipilimumab and had the cancer grow, previously had pembrolizumab and had the cancer grow, and then went on the tibentofus or immunocor drug. Um, the cancer ultimately grew after 20 months of therapy. And then the patient um, achieved this really remarkable, durable response to ipilimumab and nivolumab, um, suggesting that, or at least raising the possibility that treatment with the bunch of us changed that immune microenvironment, which we saw in those biopsies, right? With more of those myeloid cells and so forth, uh, and maybe resensitized um, the patient and the tumor to respond to checkpoint blockade. Um, and so we um, did this multi-center retrospective analysis, um, trying to look at patients who received checkpoint blockade with PD-1 or Ipinevo after to bent and we identified 29 patients who received post tibentafus checkpoint blockade and just looked at how they did. Um, and of these 28 patients who were valuable for um, survival um, and response, we found that the response rate, the likelihood of major shrinkage was um, about 16 or 17%. Interestingly, it's higher than uh, what we would expect uh, for um, <clears throat> patients treated with checkpoint blockade uh, independent of Tibentafos. If you look at how long these patients lived, uh, not long enough, but, um, but it seems like they did uh, perhaps better um, than patients who were treated uh, with checkpoint blockade, again, independent of Tibentafos. <clears throat> and so these are the guidelines, uh, the 
what we call the MCCN guidelines, uh, for uveal melanoma pre to bentifus data. Um, you know, and, and this, this is what many of us will kind of, um, you know, use for decision making, or at least use it to help guide us for decision making. Um, clinical trials are, are preferred. Um, if you're not going to do a clinical trial, then there are a number of options, including these liver directed therapies or systemic therapies. And the systemic therapies uh, included checkpoint blockade, chemotherapy, or targeted therapies. Um, it will be interesting to see how the guidelines evolve. Um, with uh, the new data with Tebentafus, because clearly now that's really going to be our frontline standard of care for patients with advanced disease if they are HLA AO201 positive. <clears throat> now, I, you know, there, there clearly has been a paucity of, paucity, paucity of randomized trial data for uh, uveal melanoma. And one of the challenges of this disease, at least previously, was that um, the selection of what we would use as a control arm was always um, difficult. Uh, and that's because we didn't have an effective um, systemic therapy. Um, what I envision uh, where we will be in the future uh, with approval of Tebentafus is that will be the um, control arm for AO201 positive patients. Uh, there's still going to be a challenge of um, what to use as a control arm, right? What to randomize people to if they're not HLAO201 positive. Um, and, uh, you know, because of that, and because we don't really have an effective therapy for those patients yet, um, it would be, um, it, it's of interest to see if there are study designs that um, can be used to minimize the number of patients have to be randomized to control arms. Uh, and let me see how I'm doing time-wise. I know we're running a little bit over, um, but I just wanted to uh, talk about the potential utility of what we call real-world data. Uh, to improve uveal melanoma outcomes uh, and perhaps optimize trial designs to minimize the number of patients have to be randomized to control arms that um, um, may be ineffective. Uh, and there are multiple real world data efforts ongoing, including um, work by the Melanoma Research Foundation, uh, a group led by Bill Harbor called the Collaborative Ocular Oncology Group, uh, and uh, uh, an effort that um, I'm working on uh, with Dr. Sullivan uh, and others um, um, as a uh, effort to um, generate the data needed to uh, um, create these what we call synthetic control arms. And so what is real world data? Uh, this is data relating to the patient health status um, that's collected from sources like the electronic medical records, um, claims data, wearable technologies, uh, like Fitbits, um, patient registries, and so forth. Um, and these registries are important because they can provide healthcare professionals and researchers with firsthand information about people with certain conditions uh, and increase our understanding of that condition. And the use of this real world evidence um, has been acknowledged by the Food and Drug Administration um, uh, that it can be used to help in drug development. Um, now, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip through a little bit uh, of this here. Um, but one of these efforts is um, an effort that's being conducted under the auspices of the International Rare Cancers Initiative. It's called OMNI, the International Ocular Melanoma Natural History Study. Uh, the overall objective of this effort is to build a registry of prospectively collected real world data um, that can be utilized by um, all stakeholders, researchers pharmaceutical companies, um, patients and patient advocates to generate real world evidence uh, to improve outcomes, facilitate drug development. And so it's a registry, it's an organized system uh, to collect data on uh, patients with this disease. Uh, and this data is um, uh, being collected for patients and family members, clinicians, researchers, pharmaceutical companies, regulatory authorities, um, um, so that again, um, they can facilitate drug development and improving um, the outcomes for our patients. This is an international effort uh, being conducted at multiple sites in North America, England, uh, Australia. Um, and this is um, being done not as a standalone effort, um, but it's being conducted uh, um, in parallel uh, to um, patient reported uh, registry efforts 
So patient-led registry efforts, such as the one being led by KRLM, the Melanoma Research Foundation, uh, and such as a, this CRUD2 group, which is really led by uh, 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 um, uh, um, a number of ocular oncology centers, surgical centers. Um, and <clears throat> the data that's being collected in these different um, registries are, are in some ways overlapping, but there are some unique data sets. For instance, in our data set, uh, we're going to be collecting um, um, data that's really relevant to the uh, medical oncologist, which includes um, kind of molecular results, um, um, tracking what treatments the patients get as well as the outcomes and so forth. Um, and interestingly, if you look at um, the patient reported registry efforts like vision, which is the Mullen Research Foundation effort, they're gonna be collecting data on symptoms and quality of life and the perceptions of value of therapies. And you can imagine that the merging of these data sets, um, tracking what patients um, are treated with what, what the outcomes are, how do the molecular features uh, fit in there, um, and how do patients feel on those therapies? And, and you know, how do they perceive the value? Is it something they're worth, they believe is worth doing given the toxicities and so forth? Um, you know, the value that that can um, bring to the field is I think tremendous. And so just in conclusion, Tibentafus is the first therapy to meaningfully improve outcomes for HLA AO201 positive patients with advanced uvula melanoma. Uh, despite this, there are significant unmet needs um, we have to improve the efficacy of this drug in untreated patients and previously treated HLA AO201 positive patients. We still need effective therapies for AO201 negative patients with advanced disease, and we desperately need effective therapies in the adjuvant setting, that is, to prevent the development of metastatic disease. The collection of real world data, I think, can be utilized to contextualize clinical trial results, hopefully, facilitate drug development and continue to improve outcomes for our patients. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.